Hello, I'm Dr. Francine Foss, and we're here in Boston at the IWNHL meeting. We're here today to talk a little bit about peripheral T cell lymphoma in our first session, and I'm joined by Laurence Delaval, who's my co-chair for this session. I'd like to start first with Dr. Weinstock, who gave a very elegant presentation talking a lot about in vivo modeling uh, and ways of identifying new targets for patients with T, uh, with T cell lymphoma. So David, could you just give us a brief synopsis of what you think are the important points? Sure, thank you, Francine. It's really a pleasure to be here. I think we all recognize that there's a tremendous diversity among the peripheral T cell lymphomas, and that presents a daunting challenge because each subtype is extremely rare. So we have uh, attempted to foster research in this area by taking primary patient samples and then implanting them into very immunodeficient mice. Those uh, lymphomas, about half of them, will then grow as patient-derived xenografts that we can characterize, we can bank, and then we can distribute to other institutions. I think you made a very salient point during the uh, presentation that the microenvironment is extremely different in an immunodeficient mouse compared to a, to a human being. We tried to present some data about how we're moving to what we consider, of course, the best model, and that is the human being with the actual disease. As our technology advances and we're able to do that more and more, it's possible that these xenograft models will play less and less role in, um, in the investigation of peripheral T cell lymphomas. But for now, it's become really clear that uh, the models serve a purpose in being able to test new compounds and genetic perturbations and in studying aspects of the in vivo microenvironment that previously weren't possible. And I know, David, from working with you personally, that those models are available to investigators, uh, folks who have an agent or want to explore a new pathway, uh, that you've been very generous in those collaborations. And I, and I know, Laurence, you actually work a lot on identifying new targets and, and new genes. So how do you interact with uh, the xenograft model system, the PDX system? How important do you think that is in, in development of these pathways and understanding the relevance of these pathways? Well, I think that's very uh, important. I'm not myself uh, working on uh, those uh, in vivo models. As a pathologist, I'm more involved in the characterization of the tissue once the PDX, PDX possibly is uh, established. But uh, definitely, uh, there have been excellent publications. And uh, David showed us today also unpublished uh, data demonstrating that the interest of that approach. Uh, I had, David, maybe another question regarding that. Uh, I see it being developed as a platform for uh, research and for testing new drug compounds, as you say. Do you think there's, uh, that in the future this uh, mouse PDX might serve the purpose of the individual patient himself? To, would it be timely to guide uh, the therapy in one possibly relapsing patient, or how does it uh, go in practical terms? Yeah, that's an outstanding question. It raises the, the specter of uh, true patient avatars. I think um, there has been a, quite a bit of effort by uh, both academic investigators and companies like Champions Oncology to move that forward. In certain settings, I think it may be feasible, um, especially where um, there are very few therapeutic options, and uh, patients are unlikely to have responses to standard of care. Uh, it may be possible to establish a xenograft, and in the three to six months that it takes for that xenograft to grow and be repropagated and really be available for a larger study, um, for there to be a window when you could test a drug. I worry quite a bit about things like lymphomas in that context because six months, and I think Francine can speak to this, she's the real clinician here, everything can change for a patient in six months. They could have a complete response to a therapy, and then a very small subclone could be selected that grows out. And so what we end up implanting and whether it will truly be useful as a predictor for therapy several months later, I think is quite difficult. The other real shortcoming of the xenograft system, and I think this, this lends to work that you've done with your colleagues, um, some of the agents like HDAC inhibitors or uh, demethylating agents like azacitidine, uh, where there are very rapid and, in, and impressive responses in subsets of patients, we haven't necessarily been able to recapitulate that in the PDXs. 
it speaks to uh, an interaction between the tumor cells and the microenvironment that our models are simply not capturing. So David, another point you brought up uh, at the end of your talk were these uh, micro nanosystems, I guess, where you're actually delivering drug in situ and looking in situ at the effects of the drug. Can you comment a little bit on that? Sure, so that, um, that is work we've been very fortunate uh, to be involved in through a collaboration with Ali Jonas, who's at the Brigham. And just to recap, these are uh, four millimeter long, they look like tiny little nails, and microscopically instilled into 20 different chambers inside the nail are different drugs or adjuvants. And these are then implanted using a standard 18 gauge needle directly into a human being's tumor. And they can be implanted in a disease like cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, you can imagine, into multiple different locations. Over the course of 48 hours, they elute these drugs that have been instilled into very geographically defined regions. And then with a simple punch biopsy, you can remove 99% of the drug and be able to study the, the response in situ to each of those drugs. I find that to be tremendously exciting, both as kind of a, a biological interrogation tool so we can start asking questions that we might not have thought of. We can start to understand, quote, super responders in a much more robust way because you're testing 20 different drugs on a patient rather than just the one. Um, and potentially, you know, in the same concept that, um, that Laurence was alluding to, instead of, you know, involved PDX models that take months and cost tens of thousands of dollars and so on, something that would be really quite facile, it will require extraordinary expertise on the part of pathologists to look at those sections and really start to understand this might be the right drug for this person, this might be the right drug for this person. There are also challenges from the FDA, and I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I have a tendency to do that, um, around the use of investigational drugs. So we were granted an IND from the FDA to use FDA-approved drugs. But what would be really exciting is to take 20 investigational drugs, all of which are in clinical trials, and put them into these devices. That's a much, much more difficult uh, regulatory process. So how uh, far away are we now from actually being able to see that implemented in a clinic? It's underway. Oh, excellent. Amazing. Yeah. Um, great, in fact, great progress. It, yeah, it's actually, well, I, again, can't take any credit. Uh, there was already a trial open in breast cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering where women who were going to get definitive breast cancer surgery would have this placed 48 hours prior to the surgery. This is the first example where um, after removal of the device, there will still be plenty of residual disease. And so theoretically, uh, in information that we gain from the device could be applied prospectively, although that's not a part of this trial. We'll be excited to hear about that at our next IWNHL meeting. <laughs> I want to uh, segue now to Lucy, who actually gave a very nice talk about HTLV-1, another disease for which we really don't have clear treatment paradigms. Uh, these patients can carry a virus, HTLV-1, for a long time, but only a subset of patients actually get sick. And Lucy, you have some insights into how we can figure out who those patients are going to be. Yes, so thank you also for um, inviting me to talk in this session today. Um, we're really focused on trying to understand which of these patients it is that might transform and develop ATL. Um, part of the importance of that is that there's no standard screening really globally for this kind of very neglected infection. But we think if we could even start by identifying uh, tools that uh, will predict those that are going to get ATL, it will actually inform screening strategies across the world because we now have a target of patients that may benefit from therapy. So we um, have a, a unique cohort of asymptomatic carriers, so people with non-malignant infection who have been coming to a research clinic for many years and we've had the opportunity to study them over decades for some. Um, and we um, have now been able to identify a small subset of patients that we think are at greatest risk. Are the uh, tests that you're using to identify these patients going to be readily available? So that's our aim. So the global burden of HTLV-1 infection is not in academic centers. So uh, we have to start by using the best available tests, but actually the aim would be to kind of scale this down to a way where people could um, employ them much more readily. And that's why we've also moved away from doing everything by high throughput sequencing to things like flow cytometry based lab, um, lab assays or qPCR, things that actually could be implemented much more locally uh, and readily. So a real question at the end of the day is how is this going to impact what we do in the clinic? So 
are you, do you have a program to preemptively say, start treating patients that you identify as very high risk? And you know, how is that gonna change the landscape for the disease? So um, up to now, we haven't been treating these individuals because we didn't know who they were until they had presented with their disease. Um, but now we do have a program where we want to start some sort of intervention um, in, within the context of trials to try and uh, see if we can knock out or remove these clones and to then try and separately quantify whether this is going to change the risk of future ACL. Sounds very exciting. And again, that's a disease that's really hard to treat. You know, those of us that are in the clinic know when patients progress, the, there really is no good treatment for them. So that's going to be very exciting in the future. I don't, David, do you have any um, insight into whether any of these model systems you've talked about would be relevant for this disease? Again, it's hard to know what therapeutic agents are, are going to work in these patients. Sure. We actually are starting to work with Lucy around the idea of, um, of looking at preemptive therapies, especially ones that have very low toxicity. Um, but it's a real challenge. And another shortcoming of the model systems is that things that grow very slowly grow very slowly. Uh, so these, these clones have probably expanded over the course of years in humans. If we were to create a facile model where they expanded over the course of weeks in mice, it wouldn't be modeling the true biology. I think that's a challenge. But I, I do actually have one comment, which is very, very positive. I think this, this program really stands as an example of how we can do very biologically interrogative research in T cell lymphomas by organizing large cohorts. And I think you're in a unique position in the UK because of your access to the blood bank and so on. But to take a disease that's really quite rare and then be able to assemble a large patient population and have access to them and, and move the field forward, I find that very impressive. And I think in general, we, we've been trying to focus over the last couple of years on getting the international community together to study T cell lymphoma. Uh, we have the T cell lymphoma forum and we have the IWNHL and we have other meetings that uh, we're now getting together uh, as a community to try to pool our resources to try to make an impact in this disease. I think that's really important and all the work that we've hear heard today I think is really tremendously helpful in terms of going the next step and, and the collaboration at IWNHL I think has been outstanding.